very uh, attractive to make comparisons to history, but very difficult. Uh, Mark Twain, the American author, said history does not repeat, but it does rhyme. Uh, in other words, it, it doesn't repeat. It's never the same. It, it, it's always different. Every cycle is different in terms of the length and the uh, violence of the fluctuations, uh, but also the, the, uh, the causes and the effects. And uh, we've never had one quite like we've seen in the last two years. Uh, first of all, the events of 2020 were not naturally occurring uh, cycles, uh, like you know most of what I've lived through. Uh, they were the events were not internal to the to the nation uh, or the uh, or the markets. They were external. We had the pandemic, which has never been seen before in a hundred years, and where the it, it was what we call exogenous. It came from outside. So it was, people ask me, which cycle is this like? And this is unique. You know, most cycles occur because uh, optimism gets too high and events become too positive, at, which is unsustainable. And then uh, things soften and uh, we go to an excess of negativity and vice and back and forth. This was not a swing of psychology or a swing of the economy. This was an external event. And then of course, uh, the recession, that we had in 2020 was not uh, naturally occurring. It too was man-made uh, exogenous. It was the result of the Fed and uh, Treasury uh, manipulation of our economy to save the world. And I don't use that expression uh, uh, loosely. I do believe that if the Fed and Treasury hadn't done what they did, we would have had a global depression. So I think they were the right thing, but I think that the economy which was the uh, analogy I use is putting the patient into a coma to save him until uh, an operation can be performed. That's what, the, that's what the US did to its economy and much of the world. They put the economy into a coma. It could be held in place until the rescue, uh, until the rescue worked. That was the lockdown, of course, the coma. Um, the uh, oil shock, which ensued from the uh, 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 OPEC oil embargo of 1973. And of course, that is probably the best analogy in terms of a, an external influence uh, at work. And it was profound. Now, the problem is that it was 49 years ago. The number of people who remember the analogy uh, are few, but it was very strong. The, the force of the embargo itself, which means you couldn't get oil, people were lined up around the block for oil. We had rationing, uh, you could only get uh, uh, gasoline every other day and so forth. Um, and then it, it contributed to and, and, and caused uh, inflation. Uh, and that, of course, that's another analogy to today. Uh, the price of gasoline went up, all costs went up. Uh, that triggered cost of living adjustment clauses in many union contracts, which caused prices to rise, which triggered further cost of living. Allowance. So we did have very strong uh, inflation uh, in the 70s, uh, somewhat related to the oil embargo, but also created to the development of uh, inflationary thinking. And I think in this country, we were on the way to developing inflationary thinking. Now, lastly, of course, we have the uh, invasion of Ukraine. And uh, it, this is probably the, the strongest, um, uh, the most prominent military action of the last uh, uh, 75 years involving, uh, well, the risk of two of the, of, the two of the great powers going to war. Right now we have one involved, but the others, uh, you know, they're possibly implicated. And so, uh, and this of course is, uh, is uh, frightening uh, psychologically. Uh, I think that if, if you ask the average person, well, what do you think the war in Ukraine is gonna do to you? Uh, I, I would say that they would probably say, well, well, probably nothing physically and maybe something economically in terms of uh, difficulty of getting fuel or inflation or so forth. And yet it's having a very strong effect. Uh, what I want to point out there is this, and this is an interesting uh, uh, phenomenon for your uh, viewers. This market, people had complained that it was too high. Some thought it was too high. Some thought it wasn't too high. 
but uh, aspects of the market, well, actually most of the market uh, from early January were on the way down and, uh, and thus and weak and susceptible to bad news. You know, there are times when, when the market, when it's doing, when it's strong, sails right through the bad news, ignores it and goes on to new highs. There are times when the market is susceptible to bad news and it causes uh, further declines and acceleration. And, uh, you know, the Ukraine situation sort of was the latter. And uh, so when you, when you throw bad news on a, on a weak market, you get declines and that's what we're having. Uh, uh, you know, the question all along was whether the market was irrationally high. Some people said it was a bubble. And, you know, I never thought it was a bubble. Um, a, a bubble means irrationally high. I thought the market was rationally high given the low level of interest rates, which cause asset prices to be high. Uh, I thought that the market was rational relative to those interest rates. The only problem is that interest rates look to go up. And in fact, they have. So uh, the market's down a bit. The S&P is probably down uh, 10% from its high, roughly speaking. Uh, that's what we call uh, that. Uh, it has passed the threshold for what we call a correction. Uh, but um, you know, uh, I, I, I still, I continue to believe that the market is not too high uh, for the current interest rates and, uh, and is not susceptible to an enormous crash from here unless we get uh, the worst of news from Ukraine. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I'm not saying the market is attractive or a bargain, but I'm saying that the downside risk, I don't think justifies getting out here. And, and it should be noted that the market is much higher than it was when the, when the pessimists started to yell bubble. It has made very good progress from that point. Number one, it's certainly a correction because it's down more than 10%, according to the S&P. And healthy, uh, healthy usually means uh, deserved, which it probably is. Prices were high and especially, and interest rates have gone up, which would cause them to fall and uh, healthy because it, it uh, eliminates some excessive optimism and it brings the uh, market to a more attractive level. So uh, I, I, I would say that it, that it probably is a healthy correction, but I must stress uh, to your audience that healthy corrections, corrections happen all the time. They're not a, a, a terrible thing. Uh, they're not something to be feared. Uh, the market does not go up in a straight line. Sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down. Sometimes it goes up too much, in which point it has to either slow its rise or decline to be back to what you would call healthy level. And this is a normal fluctuation. It's, they're never pleasant when you go through them, but these downward fluctuations are not in themselves a reason to get out of the market. Uh, I think people who sell things for the reason that they're down are making a mistake. Uh, we want to buy things when they're down, not when they're up. Uh, as they fall, it should increase our motivation. Warren Buffett says, I like hamburgers. And when they go on sale, I eat more hamburgers. Well, uh, a decline in the stock market is the equivalent of stocks going on sale. And uh, uh, I, I would agree with your assessment, a healthy correction. Uh, it was, it, it was a, uh, somewhat high at uh, 4,800. Uh, now at 4,300, it's off 10%. It's more attractive. It could go down more. I'm not saying it's not going to go down. Nobody can ever say that. But ups and downs are not to be feared. And what's most important, as you know, Ben, is the uh, long-term hold. The S&P 500, for example, index of stocks, grown at an average of 10.5% for the last 90 years. And that is a, I would call that a, what Americans call a gravy train, a, a, a good ride that you want, to, you want to participate in that ride. You don't want to jump in and jump out and jump in and that jump out because if you, if you get worried here about uh, Ukraine, nuclear, uh, China, uh, Taiwan, whatever it might be, if you get worried here and you jump out, you might fail to jump back in and you might miss the long-term ride. So uh, I think, you know, in the long run, uh, investing is 
invariably successful. People who've been on for a long time have made a lot of money. As, as one of my friends said, the key is time, not timing. Uh, it's very important to be uh, an investor for the long term, uh, wherever you live. All styles of investing and all investors have a bias. Some are more optimistic and more aggressive. Some are more cautious and protective. Some claim to be able to be aggressive when the market goes up and defensive when it goes down. Uh, you know, I, I, that is to say to do it perfectly. But I don't think anybody knows enough and is agile enough to switch from aggressive to defensive to aggressive to defensive at, at the right times and play the cycles correctly. Uh, very, very few people. That, well, first of all, there aren't many, too, many, too, uh, many opportunities to do it. And secondly, there aren't many people who can do it right. Now, I would say that at Oak Tree, we have a bias toward caution. And, uh, you know, I, I pioneered in 78 the uh, investing in high yield bonds. The high yield bond fund I started at Citibank in 1978, I believe it was the first high yield bond fund from a mainstream financial institution. And the distressed debt fund that Bruce Karsh, my, my co-founder of Oak Tree, Bruce and I founded in 1988, I believe was the first distressed debt fund from a mainstream financial institution. And uh, uh, you know, we've, we've pioneered in, in these credit areas for a long time. But in, initially when we started in each area to get people to invest, we had to promise them cautious uh, investing. Uh, we did not think it was appropriate to take an aggressive approach in a risky area. We thought that, that, the, that the winning combination was a defensive approach in a risky area. We wanted to be in the area, but not with the full risk. And so the clients came to us, that's essentially what they got and, and they're happy uh, for that reason. Um, uh, there are other people who deliver higher returns when the market goes up. We're not maximizers in that sense. And then they also lose more when the market goes down, either higher highs and lower lows or lower highs and higher lows. And the latter is pretty much descriptive of Oak Tree. So you're right. We have, we have been able to do relatively well in bad times and from bad times. And our, of course, our distressed debt funds are, uh, or what we now call our opportunities funds, are a, I think, very good way to take advantage of weakness. We don't make money in the weakness, but the weakness uh, creates the foundation for our subsequent uh, uh, profits. First of all, I, I wanna point out that I'm no economist. They are economists and they probably know better than I am uh, an expert. However, I think that the people who work in places like the Fed, economists tend to overestimate their ability to manage these things perfectly. So I think that the Fed was very smart to encourage the economy uh, positively in 2020 and, and uh, pull it out of the uh, pandemic related recession and lockdown. Uh, and I think that the Fed is, is going to discourage uh, uh, inflation now. So I think they get a good mark, but I think they're not perfect. And they, they, probably, they wouldn't say they're perfect either. So uh, the question is whether they can use these tools perfectly. And you know, we, we tend to think not. So right now, the Fed is slowing its bond buying and will eliminate it and is about to start raising interest rates uh, to choke off the inflation, which has been seen over the last, roughly the last year. So the question is, will they get it exactly right? And it's hard to think that of anybody getting anything exactly right, especially in as, as uncertain an area as economics. Uh, they'll either do it too little, inflation will not respond, in which case they'll have to uh, amplify their efforts, or they'll do it too much, whether at first or on the amplification, uh, and then that'll uh, hurt the economy um, and, and cause a slowdown, ultimately perhaps a recession. Many Fed rate increases are, give rise to uh, recessions. So uh, the ideal 
getting it done perfectly would be called what we call a, a soft landing. We get the economy to slow down, not so much that it goes into recession, but enough to choke off the inflation, which is a great thing to aspire to, but which is hard to produce. And, you know, uh, I, 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 given my experience, I do not expect perfect solutions most of the time. Oak tree really does not believe in forecasting. Uh, I think, uh, I, you know, I think it's very important to know what you don't know. And uh, there are many people in the investment business who, who think they know uh, what the future holds. Uh, I don't, we don't. Um, that makes us uh, think about our risk and, and limit it. And that makes us uh, uh, apply limits to the things we think we can do in the markets. And uh, I'm not smart enough to know uh, about a new era. I do believe that uh, most of the time, the, the, the world uh, goes back to roughly as it was. We've had many new eras proclaimed in, in my lifetime. Not too many have come to pass. And the ones that did, uh, when we got a new era, it was, it was usually unpredicted. So uh, at Oak Tree, we have an official rule that we do not base our investments on, uh, on forecasts. Uh, we base it on what we think is the value of companies and industries and securities, the small things that I think you can know. And we don't claim to know more than other people about the direction of the economy or uh, interest rates or currencies or commodities or the markets. These are macro things that nobody has a very good record of, of predicting. So uh, we're going to stick to uh, finding good companies, buying and holding their securities as long as we can. And it has what has proved out in the past. And to, to have a risk conscious mentality so that we think about what can go right, but also what can go wrong. And we try to guard against it. Um, and uh, so, you know, my, my own thought model during the pandemic uh, was that uh, uh, 80 or 90 percent of the people would go 80 or 90 percent of the way back to normalcy. And I think that was. I think that is on the way toward happening and things that we thought would never happen again, like riding on a cruise ship and so forth, they're happening again and life is going back to normal. The, the, uh, the war in, in Ukraine will upset that, will interrupt that for a while, but I think we'll continue to progress back toward what we used to call normalcy. And it's the trend of people to behave as they always have is much more dependable than any individual's forecast of a new era. Uh, so look, if you, if, if, if you say there'll be a new era and it turns out to be true, uh, then you're a smart man and people should have followed. But most uh, predictions of a new era do not come true and I would not to rely, want to re rely on them. I'm not a technology investor. I'm far from a, a technology expert. Nobody should take my advice on that subject. Uh, as I said, a man should know what he doesn't know. I don't know the answer to that question. I know that there are, uh, that technology is more and more important in our society every day. And uh, when you can, if you can find, uh, you know, the next uh, Amazon or the next uh, uh, Apple, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, the, the problem is like the other things in the investment business, these things are hard to predict. And, uh, you know, you, you, you'll, Somebody will find a stock and they'll say it's the next Amazon. It will be the next Amazon. Many other people will find stocks that they say is the next Amazon. It won't be the next Amazon. So uh, th this cannot be done with, with uh, certainty. It cannot be done with low risk. Uh, but uh, it's worth trying because, uh, you know, Amazon was uh, $6 uh, a share 20 years ago. And the last time I looked, it was $3,300. Uh, up uh, roughly uh, 500 times. I would, I would say, uh, you know, you have to find businesses that can be uh, popular, can resist competition, and can be profitable, ultimately. Not in the beginning. Yeah, these companies run losses while they're grow, being born and, and growing into, into companyhood. But eventually, they, of course, they have to be profitable. You can't make 
have a great company making something for five dollars and selling it for four eventually your sales price has to go above your cost but but uh, this is what you you, you must find uh, and uh, it's worth looking especially for those in your audience who who are knowledgeable about technology I think it's a good idea as I say that doesn't include me so I'm I, I leave myself out of that search I don't play there because I know what I don't know again um, but uh, if you can do it, it's a great thing to do. Just you, you should never assume that you are correct uh, to the extent of putting vast amounts of your money in, in any one uh, situation or even in this whole program. But, but once in a while, uh, making uh, an investment out of the belief that something can be a winning technology company, uh, it, it, it can be successful, uh, but it's no, it's no easier and maybe it's harder than any other task in the investment world.